practice as an associate professor of sociology. sociology. I started working for Spring Arbor in 1979, so that's 39 years ago. Uh, I'm director of our semester abroad program in Guatemala, and I live in Guatemala where I've been for almost seven and a half years now. So I'm going to start with a commercial. If you're all interested in a semester in Guatemala, tomorrow at 3.45 I'll be in the Willow Room answering any questions you might have. And if you want to know how great it is, just talk to Jessica right here. She was down there this summer for six weeks, and uh, I love my job. This, Guatemala, by the way, this is a good time to mention this. It's called the Land of Eternal Spring. Where I live, the record low is 48, the record high is 88. Um, so as you're approaching winter, be thinking Guatemala. <laughs> interested in uh, coming to see us. Uh, my topic today is the role of quantification and dehumanization. And I want to talk, uh, and the subtitle is Weapons of Math Destruction. I couldn't resist. Uh, a good pun. Um, just a few things. Uh, it's easy to assume from that that I don't like math, that I have an axe to grind with math. Nothing could be further from the truth. Uh, I uh, teach statistics as part of the Guatemala semester program. I did pretty well in the quantitative portion of the GRE. Uh, I spend a lot of time with the general social survey, the Uniform Crime Report, a lot of time with numbers. Uh, and so that's not my primary point. It's not math, but maybe the ways in which math is sometimes used that I'm going to get at. Uh, it's a key part of the social sciences. Uh, Clifford Geertz coined the phrase thick description. Um, I certified in two different research methodologies, experimental and field research, which is more qualitative. And he talks about qualitative uh, research as a thick description. When you do survey research, you do the Likert scale, strongly agree to strongly disagree, one to five. And it can be accurate, but thin. Thick descriptions when you're in the field and interviewing people and some things like that. Uh, but math is precise, and one of the things we, in fact, like about it. Um, Math simplifies, but does it always clarify? It's one of the questions I'll ask as we go through. Uh, and the, work, the reason I put that up here, just to give you an idea of my fascination with math, somewhere in Chicago, at Locke Elementary School, there's a desk that has 065 94808 was here carved into it, because that was my student ID number of elementary school. Uh, it's kind of a rubble on math stuff, even then. Um, an overview of where we're headed, math in the modern world. The role of mathematics in the rationalization of society, that's a key point of a sociologist named Max Weber, uh, the rationalization. Um, Weber talked about Zweck rationale in contrast to Vert rationale. Vert rationale is where the values, where the end is chosen on the basis of values and the means are chosen on the basis of rationality. Zweck rationale is where both means and end are chosen on the basis of just rational analysis kind of thing, not necessarily values per se. Um, and we'll talk about, um, based on Weber's work, George Richer wrote a book called The McDonaldization of Society. And one of the papers I wrote in grad school was The McDonaldization of Medicine, and it's been applied to a, a number of different fields. And uh, Peter Berger and Thomas Luckman uh, wrote a book called The Social Construction of Reality um, that uh, has to do with how we create meaning as human beings. And then we'll look at some case studies about counting the cost. The modern world, modernity as a period inspired by the scientific revolution and roughly coinciding with three other revolutions. We talk a lot these days about the postmodern world. But the modern world roughly co corresponds with uh, the Industrial Revolution and the political revolutions. 1776, that ring a bell? <laughs> Should, maybe a Liberty Bell. 1789, the French Revolution. So two major revolutions that kind of uh, challenge some of our assumptions about the world, particularly the divine right of kings. Uh, and we get the birth of democracy and things like that. And this also corresponds with the Enlightenment. And one of the key themes of the Enlightenment was through reason and rationality, we can perfect society, we can perfect humanity, and so forth. Uh, and the reason we live in a postmodern world is there's a little bit of skepticism about the possibilities of perfecting the society through rationality <coughs> alone. That's Max Weber. 
and I mentioned Zweck rationale, some of the areas that were subject to this kind of intense rationalization were a move from traditional authority, a tribal chieftain, an inherited kingship, and things like that, to what he calls rational legal authority. And what we mean by rational legal authority is the authority is vested in the position, not the person. And so as long as We'll use President Ellis as an example. He has authority because he's president. If he goes somewhere else or retires, he no longer has the authority. It's not in him, it's in the position. And so the next person holds the position. And that was a significant shift. And the challenge of divine right of kings was one key part of that. Uh, industrialization and the rationalization of work. Uh, Henry Ford gives us the assembly line. Um, any of you ever work on assembly lines? I worked in two different assembly lines over the years, and you almost feel like you're part of the assembly line itself sometimes as things are moving along. And I have a clip. Uh, the computer's not cooperating the best with the hyperlinks. So I'm going to try it this way and see if it works. This is from Charlie Chaplin's movie, Modern Times in 1932. Let's see. Some sound here. Because this one actually does have sound in it. <laughs> Where do I do that? Sorry, I'm used to Max. So. <laughs> no, it's just not going into the system itself right now. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Could be. The sound's not super. There we go. all day turning these bolts on the assembly line. Weber's work looks at four things. And really, what they're designed to do is create order. And he uses the metaphor, you may have heard this, but the manual for uh, McDonald's talks about how, how high to stack the french fries in the freezer and how far from the walls and everything's down to seconds and so forth. And so the idea, these things aren't in and of themselves bad. Efficiency is good, calculability, predictability, and of course, mathematics plays a pretty critical role in that, and ultimately control. And so in his book, Ritzer kind of explores the different ways in this idea of rationality and what he's calling McDonaldization works its way into even higher education, believe it or not. Some degree of McDonaldization that goes on in, in higher education through standardization of uh, processes and procedures and testing and so forth. Um, 
the um, irrationality of rationality is a coin term, I think, by Jürgen Habermas, if I remember right. If you've ever read The Little Prince, uh, it's a delightful little book, and there's one spot in it where he talks about if you ask someone if a house, is, how nice the house is, he'll tell you it costs two hundred fifty thousand dollars. I've adjusted for inflation there, uh, but they won't tell you the pretty flowers in the front yard, so you won't really know anything about the house. And they're kind of getting at that uh, kind of irrationality of rationality in some ways. There's another clip uh, I'll show. Uh, falling down. Let me make sure I have the right clip here. To give you context, this guy's had a very, very bad day. He's been laid off from work, doesn't want anybody to know, so he keeps pretending to go to work. He was threatened by a gang, and he ended up getting hold of the gang's guns. That's what he's got in the duffel bag there as he continues Hi. on his journey. Can I help you? Yes, I'd like a ham and cheese omelet, a little lamb fries. I'm sorry, we stopped serving breakfast, but we are on lunch menu now. I want breakfast. Well, you can't have it when I'm serving it. So you said. <laughs> Is that the manager? Yeah. Could I speak to him, please? Sure. Rick, there's a customer that would like to speak with you. Yes, sir. Hi. I'd like some breakfast. We stopped serving breakfast. I know you stopped serving breakfast, Rick. Sheila told me to stop serving breakfast. Why am I calling you by your first names? I don't even know who you are. I still call my boss, Mister. I worked for him for seven and a half years, but I walk in here all of a sudden, total stranger. I'm calling you Rick and Sheila, like we're in some kind of AA meeting. <laughs> I don't want to be your buddy, Rick. I just want a little breakfast. Well, you can call me Miss Folsom if you want to. Sheila, we stop serving breakfast at 11.30. <laughs> Rick, have you ever heard the expression, the customer is always right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, here I am, the customer. That's not our policy. You have to order something from the lunch menu. I don't want lunch. I want breakfast. Yeah, well, hey, I'm really sorry. Yeah, well, hey, I'm really sorry, too. <laughs> Sit down, sit down over there. Hey, 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 hey. Mister? Where are you going? No, 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 no. You sit down there and you finish your lunch. Come on. Everybody just, just relax and take it easy. Come on. Well, eat your lunch, please. Eat your lunch. You all need your vitamins A's and B's and C's. example I'll show you that you may be familiar with of uh gentlemen open your text page 21 of the introduction mr perry will you read the opening paragraph of the preface entitled understanding poetry understanding poetry by dr j evans pritchard phd to fully understand poetry we must first be fluent with its meter rhyme and figures of speech then ask two questions. One, how artfully have the objectives of the poem been rendered? And two, how important is that objective? Question one rates the poem's perfection. Question two rates its importance. And once these questions have been answered, determining the poem's greatness becomes a relatively simple matter. If the poem's score for perfection is plotted on the horizontal of a graph, and its importance is plotted on the vertical, 
but calculating the total area of the poem yields the measure of its greatness. A sonnet by Byron might score high on the vertical, but on the average on the horizontal. A Shakespearean sonnet, on the other hand, would score high both horizontally and vertically, yielding a massive total area, thereby revealing the poem to be truly great. As you proceed through the poetry in this book, practice this rating method. As your ability to evaluate poems in this manner grows, so will you. So will your enjoyment and understanding of poetry. Excellent. That's what I think of Mr. J. Evans Pritchard. We're not laying pipe, we're talking about poetry. How can you describe poetry? Well, I like Byron, I give him a 42, but I can't dance to it. I want you to rip out that page. Mm -hmm. Rip out the entire page. Here, rip it out. Rip it out. Come on, rip it out. Thank you, Mr. Dalton. Gentlemen, tell you what, not just tear out that page. Tear out the entire introduction. I want it gone. History, leave nothing of it. Rip it out. Rip. Be gone, J. Evans Pritchard, Ph.D. Rip, spread his hair, rip it out. I want there's nothing but ripping of Mr. Pritchard. We'll separate it, put it on the roll. Not the Bible, you're not going to go to hell for this. <laughs> Make a clean tear, I want nothing left of it. Okay, for the record, I'm not encouraging you to defile your textbooks. <laughs> the, uh... One of the members of the Frankfurt School once said, uh, was describing Auschwitz, the Nazi concentration camp, and he said, Auschwitz was a rational place, but not a reasonable one. What would you mean by that? Auschwitz is rational, but not reasonable. An efficient way to store and process human beings, but not one toward good aims. Good aims. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, very rational in terms of quotas and everything, tracking and so forth, but not reasonable. And that's one of the dangers when we misapply um, math and in our attempts to create order, facilitate chaos. Uh, from modernity to postmodernity, there's one writer that says the postmodern world began in uh, September of 1973. And that's the date they tore down the Pruitt Eagle housing projects. Uh, and it was kind of an admission of the failure of scientific engineering or something like that. The idea we could put all these people in a project and it would be for better good. Uh, other people give different dates for the beginning of the postmodern world. But one of the key characteristics of postmodernity is skepticism about meta narratives. And what they mean by meta narratives, the grand battle took place in the 19th century. Religion and science as the two great meta narratives, and a lot was happening in science that was challenging the accepted wisdom in religion. For example, when geologists began suggesting that the world was, in fact, millions of years old, one writer said, the ages of the rocks shook the rock of ages. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's partly because we had bad theology on that point to begin with, probably. Uh, and so skepticism about meta narratives, and we get to the postmodern world, basically postmodernists are saying to religion and science, you both overstated your claims to know and the plague on both your houses, to borrow a, a phrase from Shakespeare. Uh, in science, for example, when science says the only things knowable are the things that we can measure empirically or observe empirically, it overstates its claims by eliminating other ways of knowing, divine inspiration and other things like that. Religion has overstated its claims sometimes in its statements about inerrancy or papal infallibility or other things like that. Uh, and so there is a point to be made about skepticism about some of our meta narratives. Uh, but that's how we enter the postmodern world. And in its worst case scenario, you get a kind of um, there is no truth, whatever I say is truth is my truth and your truth, and so forth. Deconstructionism has to do with the idea of understanding that all truth claims have some political implications, and so trying to understand what's behind any given truth claim, whether it's in religion or science. And then decentering rationality becomes part of 
uh, the postmodern world too, where rationality isn't the only way of, of thinking about things. I mentioned earlier uh, Berger and Luckman, and in their book, The Social Construction of Reality in 1968, they used the term intersubjectivity to refer to what we might typically call objectivity. The fact that we reach a kind of intersubjective consensus. Uh, my father, for example, was colorblind, red, green, colorblindness. How do we know that we see the world correctly and he's the one that has a deficiency? Kind of outvoted him. We reached an intersubjective consensus about how we see the world, not just in the physical world, but in the political and other areas. So we reach an intersubjective consensus, which we externalize. It becomes objectified uh, in terms of maybe laws or other kinds of things that make it an objective reality. And then it acts back on us and is internalized. And so this is what they mean by the social construction of reality. The things we take for granted to be real are socially constructed through intersubjective uh, dialogue and consensus. Harvey Cox is the one that described Taoism as the national religion. Not Taoism as T-A-O-I-S-M, but Taoism as the in the Tao Jones. Uh, in his analysis, he says it's almost like the oracles of old where we consult. Actually, there's a room just below this uh, on the next floor <laughs> that has the little stock symbols going around and so forth. And if uh, the numbers aren't pleased, you offer up a sacrifice by way of a layoff or something like that. Uh, and so he argues that Taoism is really our national religion. Uh, there's a case to be made for that uh, in terms of the extent to which we organize our lives around how well markets are doing and some things like that. And it's, it's not that the Tao is giving us bad numbers necessarily. It's basically how we're using the numbers and thinking about the numbers. Um, quantification and spec rationale in the church. Um, this would be my critique. The, when John's disciples come to Jesus and say, are you the one we're looking for or should we look for another? How does he reply? He says, the offering last week was this amount and attendance was this amount. And no, <laughs> uh, the blind see, the lame walk, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. Um, but how do we measure in our bulletins on a Sunday? Just a thought. Uh, and Weber's point is that Zweck rationale has affected, or maybe infected, all areas of life, that kind of hyper-rationality. Uh, and with it comes the death of what he called vert rationale, where values drive our decisions first and foremost. And the numbers can help us make good decisions, but only if we're asking the right questions. Uh, one of the examples here, Martin Luther King is the person that said, we live in an era of guided missiles and misguided men. And so math will help us create the guided missiles, but it won't tell us when and where and how to deploy. And one other example of this, Martin Buber has a book called I and Thou. I-Thou relationships are kind of soul-touching soul, where it's personal and so forth. I-It relationships are a relationship between self and an object. And we sometimes have language, not to pick on McDonald's here, but the language of interpersonal relationship when it's really two objects. Go through the drive-thru sometime, and they'll welcome you to McDonald's, and then afterwards, they'll thank you for choosing McDonald's, and when you are saying, well, thank you, and have a nice day, the doors, the windows closing in your face, because uh, we're really just running a script, and we're objects relating to each other at that point. If you don't believe me, go through the line of touches and try to engage someone at the cashier's point about uh, their family and uh, how things are going and their health and so forth. Uh, case studies and counting the cost. This is probably the classic case study. Back in the 80s, uh, Ford Pintos had a problem that they would impact uh, or could explode on rear end impact. And the accountants at Ford ran the numbers. Uh, and on the basis of making a decision. Basically, they associated, they basically said if we don't repair the vehicles, we anticipate 180 burn deaths, 180 serious burn injuries, 2,100 burn vehicles, we estimate 200,000 per loss of life lawsuit, 67,000 per injury, 700 per vehicle for a total of $49.5 million. If we don't repair, 
uh, I'm sorry, the cost of repairing the defective vehicles, 11 million cars, 1.5 million light trucks, at the cost of $11 per car or $11 per truck would cost Ford Motor Company $137 million. Anyone want to guess what they did? Yeah, they didn't do it. And this is what I mean when I say both the means and the end are, are chosen on kind of, let's run the numbers and see what we get at that point. And values, I think, should come into play here. I once lectured in my wife's business policy class and was posing the question, you guys are on the board here, and you have to make the decision. What do you do here? And how do you convince the other people sitting around the table that you need to do the right thing? And person after person was saying, well, you have to convince them that the long-term costs because of PR would be worse, et cetera. Uh, and so they're still really arguing on the basis of anticipated numbers. Uh, and finally, one student say, can I just say that it's wrong not to? And I said, bless you. I mean, that, it ought to be that easy to say this is the right thing to do, even if it costs us money. But when we're doing this kind of calculus, we can make some bad decisions. This is one of many examples. Uh, you might have seen other examples in the news lately of uh, pharmaceutical things being quadrupled in price, like the EpiPen and things like that. Uh, this is from Wayne Muller's book, Sabbath, and it's related to Joseph Stiglitz, Stiglitz has a book called Mismeasuring Our Lives, and he argues that GDP is not the best way to look at how a society is doing. And one example of that, Terry and I were talking to someone who has a PhD in um, a related field, and he knows all about GDP, he'd never heard of the Gini coefficient. The Gini coefficient is a way of measuring inequality in a society. And so simply GDP growth rate doesn't tell us how the money is being distributed, how the, who's benefiting from the growth and who's not. Uh, and so you have to take the two measures together. Well, this is what Mueller says about GDP. Every time someone gets cancer, the GDP goes up. Every time an infant dies, the GDP rises. The drive-by shooting improves the economy by $20,750. An oil tanker spill can contribute between five and twenty million dollars of quote unquote growth. But a woman who's volunteering at a health clinic doesn't contribute anything to the GDP. Uh, and so that question about taking that as our sole measure of a society, uh, and again, it's not that the math is bad, it's the application of math uh, in that case. And attempts to create chaos, by order I mean, can uh, actually lead to chaos. Uh, I worked for Firestone many, many years ago, and they were making a defective tire called the Steel Radio 500. We all knew it was defective. Uh, and I probably personally handled 400 defective tires. Uh, and I called the main office at one point and told them people are going to sue us, they're threatening to sue us. And the response was, we've got 12 attorneys who are on retainer. They get paid whether they're in the courtroom or sitting in their offices to let them sue us. Uh, and it's another case of that uh, looking solely at the bottom line, what's it going to cost us to think similar to the Ford uh, Motor Company? Walmart and reasonable profits. Um, there's something like $2 billion spent on Walmart workers' welfare as the government contributes to welfare spending for Walmart workers because the wages are low. I was trying to figure out uh, Walmart profits at one point were $100 billion, and that's a number I just know there's lots of zeros after the one. So I was trying to figure out what $100 billion looks like. So I got out my spreadsheet and figured if you were hired to count $100 billion in $100 bills, and you're counting at the rate of $200 per second, 100, 200, et cetera. At the end of a 40-hour work week, you have counted $28.8 million. If you started when you were 18 and retired when you were 65, you would have reached $73 billion. But you couldn't count it in a lifetime at that rate. In other words, a lot of money. But I wanted to get a sense of what that much money looks like. And so some of those questions about what's a reasonable profit is not easily answered. Uh, Isaiah 58 talks about exploiting workers. Unfortunately, it doesn't have a footnote that says exploit equals X when etc. Uh, it'd be nice if we could have that. 
Uh, telemarketing and the colonization of life worlds. Not just telemarketing, but any of you getting phone calls about politics these days? Uh, uh, and part of what they mean, Jürgen Habermas is the one who coined the phrase colonization of life worlds because you become an object to be telemarketed to or uh, recruited in that kind of a way. Um, McDonaldization of medicine, education, prisons, churches. Uh, Adam Smith, in The Wealth of Nations, written in 1776, <laughs> argues that uh, capitalism works on the basis of enlightened self-interest. Reasonable question is who puts the light, or what puts the light in enlightened self-interest, and what happens when we have just raw, naked self-interest uh, kind of thing. And again, the, uh, our attempts to have an order we will can have some consequences of chaos for other parts of the world. From quantification to objectification and dehumanization is one of the costs, and this is the quote I mentioned earlier by Martin Luther King. We live in an age of guided missiles and misguided men. Good. I wanted to leave some time for questions, debates, arguments, and so forth. So, who wants to start us off? Your quote by Dr. Martin Luther King suggests that there was an age prior to that in which men were guided. And there were no <laughs> that's a fair point. We just don't have the missiles. And I don't know that that's necessarily fair. I think we're looking at the fundamental failings of the human soul in any of this. Sure. That we're all imperfect. Yes. And the idea that men are misguided is not a new advent, but something that's been with us since conception. Yeah, the dawn of time. Probably, yeah, that's fair enough. Yeah. But it's more dangerous when they have the guided missiles. <laughs> there was no Hiroshima and Nagasaki prior to. That's the date I would put kind of the end of the modern world because the idea that rationality would solve all our problems when you get in the same war, the Holocaust, Hiroshima, and Nagasaki, and so forth. So the scale of what we can do with our missiles instead of spears is increased significantly, which means the, the soul part is that much more important. So how does, you, let's say you're leading an organization, how does your leadership uh, vary depending on whether it's a, a nonprofit and a for profit. You've got your metrics either way. And yeah. You're trying to figure out how to stay true to it, mission and, and larger values. Yeah. I forget what the drug was, but one of the recent increases, like a 400% increase in the cost of the medicine, uh, was justified by saying I have a moral obligation to stockholders. And you do, by law. Uh, you, you are obligated to look out for the interests of stockholders. But I think that has to be balanced with the interests of other stakeholders. Employees are stakeholders. Consumers are stakeholders. The environment is a stakeholder in that. And some companies do that reasonably well. Years ago, I visited Ben and & Jerry's. And I didn't just go because I like chocolate fudge brownie, but their factory in Vermont. And when they first started, they had a 7 to 1 ruling about wages. The CEO couldn't make seven times more than the lowest paid worker. But they wrote a book called Double Dip. And they're arguing, yep, you've got to have this first accounting line. You've got to be there. But you need a second one that looks at social responsibility. Uh, for example, they buy their, I don't know if they still do, because they've since been bought out by Unilever. And I don't know how that affected their, their corporate values. But they buy the brownies. They used to buy the brownies from a bakery in New York that hires ex-cons to help them re-enter society. And so, yep, we've got to look at the bottom line, but how can we, in our purchases in other areas, balance that with the impact on society and how we can do good? So there are examples out there, sometimes hard to find. Uh, and, and that's partly because we look, we have just one metric for using and saying, let's look at profitability, let's return on investment, that's what really matters kind of thing. Other questions or comments? Yeah. Um, I was going to ask about, do you think it's a consequence of our culture that it is this way? Like, um, I was going to say, is there a way that we could do a capital, like capitalism, yeah. in a moralistic way that does look out for other people and enlightened self-interest? I or think so. Is there, because I was going to say, I think that a lot of people, with, in response to the way that the world is, especially in this country, entirely retract from that system and look for other ways. 
I think uh, I, I've wrestled with this long and hard because I at times have thought responsible capitalism is an oxymoron. Uh, but the countries that are sometimes described as socialist, the Nordic countries, Denmark, Norway, Sweden, Finland, are capitalist countries. The CEO, the former CEO of Legos, lives in Denmark, has something like $5.4 billion. Sounds like a capitalist to me. Uh, they do have higher taxes, 51% top tax rate. But they have universal health care, tuition-free education. Is that something? Uh, in Denmark, not only tuition-free, but they pay roughly $725 a month to help you cover living expenses. Yeah. And so they tax more, but I always say you have to look at what you're paying in taxes in relation to what you're getting for what you're paying in taxes. There's two sides of that equation. Uh, and they seem to have found a way to be a capitalist country, but one that has a pretty strong sense of social responsibility. I think one of the reasons it's difficult for us is those countries tend to be much more homogenous. Yeah. They all look like me, they're, they're my kin, so to speak. And we've got way too, a whole lot of us, them, in our society that keeps us from, I think, that same kind of mentality of looking out for each other and some of those kinds of things. But I think those are models that can work, and I think they're out there. There's a, if you get a chance, there's a thing called the Legatum Prosperity Index that ranks all the countries of the world on nine different dimensions. And those four countries are all in the top seven. I think they're one, three, five, and seven in Norway topping the list. The US comes in at 18. Uh, and again, they're all capitalist countries. They all have different strengths. But I would cite those as an example where, yes, capitalism, but capitalism with a pretty strong safety net. And it's really a question of which things should we consider public goods? And we have a fairly narrow definition. We have libraries and roads and other things, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, that we treat as public goods. Those countries have a larger, a more expansive sense of things that we should and could consider public goods. And since I mentioned, go ahead, Terry. Well, I was just going to say, an example of that is insulin. Uh, Europe, they pay one-sixth of what we pay for insulin. Yeah. And it's partly because the you know it's healthcare, it's nationalized healthcare, but it's also the governments are saying this is life giving a life giving substance to a large percentage of people in our in our country and we're not gonna let you charge that much. So then you get the government involved with a whole other issue I guess as well with that. Yeah. Well since I mentioned GDP earlier, the US spends about eighteen percent of GDP on healthcare. Uh, England, Japan, Germany, Czech Republic, so for about 10% of GDP on healthcare and cover everybody. Uh, and so about 15 years ago, the New York Times had a headline, US healthcare, the best in the world are just the most expensive. And their conclusion was pretty much the most expensive. I'm type 2 diabetic and I take a medicine called Invokana. When I went to the Weatherwax here to get my 90-day supply because I hadn't met my $3,000 deductible, the cost for 90 days was $1,321.41. In Guatemala, without a prescription, I can walk in and get the same drug by the same manufacturer for $300 for a 90-day supply. Same drug, same manufacturer. I mean, it seems like something might be wrong with that system somewhere along the line. Well, that's an interesting point, and, and I don't want to be argumentative, but oh. right now in the news, we know of a, a significant uh, movement of people, some of them yep. being Guatemalans, who are coming to, apparently, America yeah. to, what, I don't know, benefit from the system that we have here, if you listen to the interviews that we're having with them. How would you explain this seeming contradiction? Partly because the Guatemalan healthcare system is two-tier. For me, it's a whole lot cheaper. My grandson was born there by C-section, private hospital, private room, $1,500. Is that about the same cost as the U.S.? <laughs> no. I mean, okay. um, and so for people, like, but for most Guatemalans, that's out of reach. And so they're gonna to turn to a midwife. Poverty rate in Guatemala, about 53%. 49.8% of kids under five are undernourished. It's the fourth highest rate in the world. Uh, and one of the six highest, six highest homicide rate in the world. And so they're coming here is escaping that kind of stuff. And so even at the bottom of the run here, they may be better off than they would be in Guatemala. And, but part of that is 1944 to 1954 were the 10 golden years in Guatemala. 
uh, October 20th, which just passed, is still a national holiday, Revolution Day. They had a revolution, deposed a dictator, and it was the opening up of democratic spaces, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, free elections, and so forth. In the next 10 years, they built more schools than in the entire previous history of Guatemala. Part of what they were doing was land reform. 10% of the population still today owns 86% of the land. And the single largest landowner was United Fruit Company, which today goes by the name of Chiquita, you might have heard of it. Uh, and they own land throughout Central America, the Caribbean, and so forth. And what they were going to do is buy the uncultivated land from United Fruit Company using eminent domain. And they were going to pay them fair market value, and they would determine fair market value by the worth that United Fruit Company had declared on its taxes. Only well, United Fruit Company was trying to undervalue the land to cheat on their taxes, and so they weren't real happy with this. Two of the board members of United Fruit Company were Alan Dulles, who was head of the CIA, and John Foster Dulles, who was Secretary of State. And so in 1954, we had a CIA-sponsored coup d'etat called Operation PV Success that destabilized the country of Guatemala, handpicked the dictator we would install. That was followed by 36 years of civil war in which 200,000 people were killed. 50,000 disappeared, a million displaced, and the UN Human Rights Commission declared it a genocide. Uh, at one point, I was, again, I was trying to make sense of these big numbers that are more than I have of anything, I think, except maybe cells in my body. But I was trying to figure out what 200,000 people killed like in Guatemala. If you adjust for population, it would be like the entire state of Michigan gone. Uh, and so it's, it's still an open wound. They, they signed the peace accords in 1996, just 22 years ago. Um, but, and at the same time, the war was going on in Nicaragua, Iran-Contra and all of that, and El Salvador. I visited a refugee camp in Honduras that had 6,000 refugees. Uh, and I later spoke to one of the congresspersons who said, we have um, Nicaraguan refugee camps, Salvadoran refugee camps, Guatemalan refugee camps, and we're the second poorest country in the hemisphere. What are we supposed to do with all these people? And so part of my thing with immigration is we play a significant role in destabilizing that part of the world. And it made perfect territory for the gangs. It, it's the main transit point, they call it the Northern Triangle, the main transit point for drugs coming from South America through that. And MS-13 and Mara Salvatrucha are the two big gangs that operate there. And they stepped into a vacuum that was created by that, that civil war. And so that's why people are coming. Yeah, and they'll continue to come. The day we finish building a 30-foot wall, someone's building 32-foot ladders. <laughs> and it, the only way to stop that is to reverse it and help them rebuild the country some way. Most Guatemalans would prefer to live in Guatemala. It's the land of eternal support. I prefer to live in Guatemala, Michigan. Uh, and it's, for Guatemalans, it's the food you know, it's the culture you know, it's the language you know, and so forth. And many are sending their children because they're saving their lives. Yeah, sending their children. Yeah. Uh, this is maybe kind of a backwards question, but I work in a church, and therefore, you know, you have nonprofit status, and you work with a lot of other nonprofits. And so you aim for, well, it's very easy to McDonaldize yourself in a church, of course. Um, but you aim for good stats. But I've even seen, like, the good stats of, like, here's the social things we've done kind of become dehumanizing yeah. in a certain extent, where it's like, uh, hey, why is a minority in this video? Well, you know, yeah, we take care of minorities. Yeah. Whereas, yeah. like, now they're not a person anymore. You're using them almost as a cause for yourself or for income. And people say, oh, well, they take care of minorities, things like that. Like, that's a good stat, but it's also dehumanizing when yeah. they are no longer a person. Do you have any good, like, thoughts as to like how to navigate? It, it, uh, it's a challenge. Uh, Gustavo Gutierrez, who wrote Theology of Liberation, uh, and one of his quotes is, so you care deeply about the poor, name one. And his point is that caring deeply is one thing, but having enough intimacy that you know in a different way, not just somewhere counting somewhere and things like that. I had an experience 
I'll leave names out of it, but I was working in the prison when they had riots. My first job for Spring Arbor was running their prisoner education program. So I had an office in the world's largest walled prison, not far from here, and they had riots. And I'd gotten out for lunch, and I'm standing outside the gates watching the riots go on, not realizing it was hitting the radio. So my wife is wondering where I am and what's happening in the riots and all this. And I get back to campus, and uh, the first three people I met were all, man, we're so glad to see you your city. We were calling your office, and nobody was answering. Uh, I saw one of our administrators, and he said, Pam, I'm so glad to see you. How secure are our financial records out there? Hmm. <laughs> secure, but I'm okay too, thanks. <laughs> uh, it's just one of those things that kind of strikes you in that moment about how some of that stuff, you get so caught up in the numbers, however, that we can lose sight of some of that pretty easily. And it's because we live in that kind of world where the numbers are what matters. Uh, I used to do grant writing. They're looking for evaluation strategies up front. How you measure success, and they want quantitative measures of success. And I think one thing too with your question, another thing because I think there's a lot of things that you do, and it's how we talk about people. So I remember sitting one time uh, when somebody said we need to change our language and the way that we identify people. So instead of calling them poor people, we call them people who live in poverty. So that their first identification isn't that they're poor or a prisoner, but they're a person. It goes back to that I vow. So I think that's a piece of it, is changing language. And that's not going to change everything, because attitudes have to change too. But I do think there's more than a nuance there of difference. Yeah. Well, it gets back to that point about souls and mm -hmm. the, the importance of the human soul kind of thing that can't be so quantified uh, and so forth. And it's, it's not diminishing the good things that quantification can do, but it has to be balanced by the other piece uh, somewhere along the line. Yeah? Uh, I was going to ask. There, like when we're talking about the Ford Pinto, for example, yeah. uh, the difference between 48 million dollars, or what was it again? It was like 48 versus... It was like half a billion. 137. 137. That's what I was thinking. The difference was, yeah. is insane. Like, yeah. I mean, you know, yeah. so mm -hmm. I was going to say, I hate to be, because I'm a business major, obviously. Yeah, so, yeah. you know what I mean? Um, there's a little part of me, though. Like, obviously, my more humanitarian heart was like, oh, that's horrible. Who would do that? That's awful. And then there's a little, little voice in the back of my head that was like, Oh, that's a lot of money. Yeah. Oh, so my and it is. My question yeah. is this: the two, like, should I be endorsing a change of culture to value people more than money from yeah. this point on, or should I be like using my logical brain to be like trying to dissuade people from going after short-term? Like gains One like of the things I would push, I wish we had, Germany has something called worker co-determination laws. Mm -hmm. If you're a large company like Walmart, by law, half of your board members must be employees of the corporation, including a certain percentage that punch a time for. Mm -hmm. Would decisions look different with that configuration of a board of directors? No. No. Really no. different. You have to then, and it basically it's saying, Yes, stockholders have to be represented by the board of directors, but there are, in fact, other stakeholders who are affected by what happens here, and they need voice somehow. And so part of what I would say is just finding ways to give voice to all st stakeholders in a decision. It doesn't mean everybody gets to make the final decision and so forth, but uh, increasing the voice of stakeholders, and including community members and so forth. Yes? Sort of. A different thought I had about uh, the two statistics about preparing versus not preparing. Uh, how do you think it would affect people if someone were to ask them, like, okay, how much would someone have to pay you to go out and murder a random one of your customers, and then multiply that by the number of people who are predicted to die? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But if part, part of putting on a spreadsheet, yeah. uh, spreadsheets are science and art. Uh, I discovered that in going over some budgets here one time, where where you put things on the spreadsheet and how you classify what goes where is sometimes more art than science and things like that. Um, and um, but the, you can dehumanize or objectify by just turning it all into numbers and not thinking about faces behind numbers and things like that somewhere along the line. And that would force it a little bit to say, no, we have to move into a more active mode. 
of thinking about this. Yeah, do you think uh, all this, uh, or someone, if, if someone is concerned about the objectification and how uh, numbers are used to dehumanize, um, do you think it's a, a, a worthwhile strategy to double down on the use of numbers but just show the value uh, that's being overlooked, or abandon that numerical, you know, kind of description and, and go towards a qualitative. Like, for example, you know, if I'm concerned about the environment um, and the Amazon rainforest, uh, I can put a, a number value, a, a dollar value on that and say, hey, you know, um, we're actually better off if we preserve it. Um, so can number, or is that just uh, perpetuating the system of attaching it, a dollar? A uh, a real world example that just recently uh, one of our politicians was saying, yeah, I think climate change is happening, but we can't sacrifice the economy. Said, well, maybe long term sacrificing, <laughs> not just the economy, but everything else if the climate change predictions are accurate. Uh, and so the one thing is easier to quantify. Uh, and so it makes it simpler to look at that, more complex to look at the long term projections and other things like that somewhere down the line. Um, it, it's basically understanding what the numbers do best and what they can't do. When I worked in the prison, at one point we had close to 350 students. Uh, and I had in my area, I think about 150. And I made a concerted effort to learn their names. Uh, and I don't know how many times inmates thanked me for using their names, because they're called for a visit by, a visit for 176234, and so forth. And just the, the ways in which that dehumanize us. That's not who I am. That's not me. That's the number you gave me kind of thing. Uh, and so different things like that, I think, uh, finding ways to humanize the world as best we can. Um, and numbers are important, really important. I just finished doing a report on our budget for the Guatemala semester and different things like that. And it's absolutely essential. But the human factor has to, whether you use Ben and Jerry's double dip strategy of having two lines or something else, it's something that has to be brought up. You were mentioning the church is a nonprofit. Years ago, I heard Bishop Bates say, the church is in danger of becoming a nonprofit organization. Well, he spelled it P-R-O-P-H-E-T. Mm -hmm. And the Old Testament prophets were the ones who went before the kings and said, this is not right. This is not what you should be doing. And I think the church has, to a large extent, advocated that role in many ways. Um, we've become part of that culture rather than saying, this is what we should be thinking about. This is how we should be talking about this. And um, the human dimension is important. Uh, and I think the church can and should play a critical role in that. Other questions we have? Yeah, thank you. Well, and just a little anecdote uh, in terms of numbers and do the numbers really say what yeah. the numbers are supposed to say? This is about 20 years ago that all the free Methodist churches in Southern California, I don't know if it was spread over in Michigan too, had to do a, an annual survey of the members. And there was a quantification that would come out of it that would indicate whether the church was healthy or not. And that would affect the possible reappointment of the pastor and so on. And you want it to be above 65, because there was some study that shows all these measures above 65. But I wound up writing a letter to the superintendent uh, encouraging that the survey be abandoned, because when you drill down into it, uh, one of the questions, for instance, was needs-oriented evangelism. And it asked you, uh, how many non-Christians do you spend time with uh, okay. per week, or something like that? And I thought, you know, they're looking for lots of numbers. They're looking for yeah, yeah. 20 people. Well, people could be very evangelistically oriented and just spend time with one person. Yeah, yeah. That yeah. could be a passionate evangelism. Another one was um, working with the pastoral staff is a real challenge. Well, that could be taken both ways. A real <laughs> challenge meaning what an opportunity. Yes. Or yes. a real challenge meaning this guy is a hindrance. Yeah. So I wrote a letter pointing this out, pointing out the invalid use of the statistics, and the response was a little disconcerting. Yeah. It was, I'd rather use something than nothing. Yeah. 
even if something is misleading. Yeah. Well, uh, now, now the survey is not being used. Okay, yeah. good. Yeah. <laughs> well, one example I use in my research design classes, there's a website called Daily Caller that's pretty conservative. And they had a headline a while ago that said, only 3% of Americans concerned about global warming. And they were citing a Fox News survey. And I looked at the, the, and there was a few problems with the questions they were asking, but the sampling was good, all of that. But what they asked was, of all of these, which is your number one concern? Well, 3% picked climate change, not global warming. So that was the first flip from the headline, because those, those are two different things. But they also had all of the above, and 14% said all of the above. So now you have 17% that say they're concerned, but the headline says only 3%. And at no point do they ask, what's your second greatest concern? So given the way it's structured, it could be that 100% of people have it as one of their top two concerns from the data. And so that's one of the things that's, I think, the value of liberal arts education is learning to drill down on that stuff and saying, OK, it, it may be the right percentage, but did they ask the right question? Are they applying it in the right way? That kind of thing. And, and that's uh, an important part of critical thinking, I think, to be able to pull that stuff apart. Anything else? Okay, just Well, is capitalism bad? Can be. I don't is think socialism it's... bad? Can be. Okay. So, in the, fact, the, uh... the vast majority of countries in the world are mixed economies. Uh, and that's why I, the whole capitalism versus socialism, we're becoming a socialist country. Be, if socialism means the government provides some goods and services, we've been socialist for a long, long time. Uh, and the real question is what is the mix? between private and public, between the role the government plays. Even Cuba has gone towards more liberalization of their economy, some elements of entrepreneurship and free enterprise within that. North Korea may be the only communist country left on the face of the earth. Uh, and so the real argument we should be having is, what about the mix? And, and that's where I'm a little more left of center in that I would argue, let's make healthcare public good. Let's make education public good. Um, and once we can be sure that every person has food, clothing, shelter, health care, and access to education, let the markets go where they may. If somebody wants to pay $5,000 for a Super Bowl ticket, bless them. I'll, I'll watch TV instead. Right? Um, and so I, I'm okay with mixed economies, but um, I think unrestrained capitalism is inevitably exploitative because it imbalances, it so privileges the capitalist at that point. That and unrestrained socialism? Same, I mean, the- Inherently Elvin, exploitative? No, I'm saying it, it becomes exploitative too. The Elvin Gouldner said it best, communism is a system in which man exploits his fellow man, and capitalism it's the other way around. Mm -hmm. In other words, his way of saying both systems can be exploitative, mm -hmm. and they can't. Uh, and that's where finding the balance can be really critical. And we can get to the balance if we can speak up on behalf, which is all over scripture about speaking up on behalf of the widow, the alien, the orphan, the vulnerable, and so forth. And I've been to DC four different times to lobby on Capitol Hill on poverty issues. Uh, and, that, and there aren't a, a lot of paid lobbyists who do that, and I wasn't paid for the record. Uh, if I did, I never got the check. Right? Uh, people somewhere, and I think it's the church has to be the, the party that speaks up and says, wait a minute, what about the most vulnerable in our society and who speaks for them? And, and I think there's place for that. Thank you so much. We're out of time. I'm very